book and took advantage of the drive uh, to listen to the book. Thank you for putting unbelievable amount of time and research uh, into that. Uh, and uh, it was to Chicago, so it was very relevant uh, as we were navigating Chicago traffic. Um, it kept our, our uh, blood pressure down as we're listening to it. It was really appropriate given the drivers up there. But I was giving her a hard time because I also looked at her schedule of events and she's uh, all over the country uh, doing these speaking engagements, but we're grateful for her to um, have the uh, engagement in Carmel, what was that, a month or so ago, right? And then to come over here to Fishers for us. So um, welcome and we're happy to have you. Thank Thanks you so much. so much. Thank you. Can I hold this or? You can hold this one. Perfect. Can everyone hear me? Okay, maybe I'll just hold this. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you here tonight um, in Fishers. I My home is Indianapolis. So it was just a, a short drive uh, up the street to, to, to make it here. And I want to thank um, the Knowledge Services team. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Delaney. Thank you, everyone, for opening your facility, your beautiful facility here to us tonight and hosting this event. Thank you to Jeff and, and, and John DeLucia for, for, for making this happen, especially for having the vision and saying, I want to I want to make this a thing in, in Fishers as well. So thank you for your for your vision and your leadership and caring about this most essential question of our day. How do we flourish across deep difference? This is the most important question of our day. And thank you to each of you. It is a magnificent day today. It's what it's 75 degrees. It's beautiful right now. I I, I know uh, many of you would rather be you know picnicking with your kids right now. And um, so thank you. You guys are the true remnant for being here and choosing to be part of this conversation here tonight when you have a million other things that you know, it's been it's been cold, it's been a long winter and, and dreary weather. So uh, thank you for, for going for going that this evening and, and being here for this essential conversation. Um, I counted a real privilege to 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 work alongside local leaders like Jeff, um, like like Joe, Jeff Worrell from from Carmel City Council and, and, and like John. And it was great to meet Tiffany from, from Fisher City, City Council as well on my walk-in. Thank you, Tiffany, for being here as well. Um, and and it's, it's a privilege to, to, to work alongside local leaders who care about this topic, who care about their community, who have felt viscerally the division in our recent, in our recent years uh, that has, have come to even paragons of civility like Carmel and Fishers that have may have been largely insulated from these deep divisions from, from you know, political violence, from extremism that is actually threatening democracies around the world right now, but it's coming. It, it, it's here. It's present. And so it's really important that we're all here. Uh, it's a real honor for, for me to be here as well. Thank you for, for having me here tonight. So as I, as I noted, uh, my book, The Soul of Civility, Timeless Principles to Heal Society and Ourselves, is about this most essential question of our day. How do we flourish even when we deeply differ, even when we deeply disagree. And I uh, came to my interest in this topic, honestly, first of all, I was raised um, in a home that was very mindful of, of social norms, attentive to social norms and expectations. My mother is called Judy the Manners Lady, and she's a wonderful person. She was at our Carmel event, and many of you have met her, and she's just this, this um, effervescent personality, just a, a, a buoyant personality full of joy and, and life. She's someone that lights up the room wherever she goes and, and just leaves every person she meets better off. And so in addition to just leading a life that re reweaves and he heals our social fabric and brings light and life into people's lives in a world full of darkness and division and brokenness, she also teaches people social graces, and she has my entire life. She's uh, she's called the manners lady, and she you know t instructed my my brothers and I how to how to shake hands firmly and look people in the eye, how to set the table just so, and uh, and these and other social graces, while also modeling for us true civility, hospitality, kindness to the stranger. Our home growing up was this revolving door of, of strangers, um, of newcomers to our community. She's just an incredibly hospitable person practically, but also uh, in, 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 every, in, every, in, every, in, every, in every sense of the word. So I went from this, um, this environment, um, uh, you know, mindful of social norms and expectations. Um, I ended up at the United States Department of Education, where I was all, all of a sudden in an environment of anti-human flourishing. And that was the immediate impetus for me writing this book. I was there 2017 to 2018 in Washington, D.C., in a very divided time in our nation's in our, in, in our nation, in our world. And um, 
all of a sudden, everything I thought to be true about myself and the world around me was refuted. It was questioned. Everything I thought, all my, all my confidence and, and social graces and politeness and common courtesy to help us navigate deep difference, that was, that was questioned, that was refuted. And I was, I was made to wonder, you know, uh, you know, what is the bare minimum of respect that we are owed and owed others by virtue of our shared humanity and shared dignity? And what does that look like in practice, even when the stakes are high? And even when we deeply differ and deeply disagree. So I, I, I survived a year of, of tour in federal service. And after, I threw myself into this project because I didn't feel like I was being part of the solution in government. And I desperately wanted to be. And so I left government and started thinking about these questions about personhood, about human dignity, about the bare minimum of respect that we are owed to others by virtue of our shared personhood. And I, and I began working on this book. That's kind of my moral foundation. Uh, how I approach this, this question, this topic of civility is through the lens of personhood uh, and, 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 and in our common humanity and our shared, and our shared dignity. And while I was writing my book and, and researching for it, I surveyed this genre of, of ethics, of etiquette manuals, of conduct manuals from across history and across culture. And I discovered that this is, yes, the most important question of our day. There's a reason why, why people like John and Jeff are, are urgently, they feel a sense of urgency to have this conversation in our communities right now as we enter uh, a, a divisive presidential election cycle and as as there's these divisions are coming to our homes to our schools to our to our kitchen tables dividing family families and lifelong friendships there's a reason that we're having this conversation now and yet while i was researching uh, for this book i realized that this is not a new question it's actually a timeless one this is this is the defining question of democracy, how do we peacefully coexist even when we disagree? Uh, this is the defining question of the classical liberal project. How do we how do we live peacefully in a pluralistic society? This is the uh, defining question of our species as well. Uh, as long as we've been around as human beings, we've tried to do this thing called life together with others. We are doggedly social, profoundly social as a species, and yet morally and biologically, we're also defined by self-love. We are driven to meet our own needs before others. And these two, these two facets of who we are are intention, this love of others and love of self. And that is why this joint project of living well with others in community, in friendship, in democracy, and civilization itself is always fragile. It is never a foregone conclusion. It is always a precarious proposition that requires the vigilance of our everyday decisions, minute by minute actions to surrender our immediate desires for the sake of the human social project of living in peace, peace and harmony of others for the sake of, of, of cooperating, collaborating and achieving our potential as individuals, but also in community as well. So a timeless human problem. I open the story in my book. I open my book with the oldest story in the world. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Okay, just a handful of you. Well, I'll, 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 I'll whet your appetite. It's, it's a wonderful story. I, I open my story, um, uh, my book with that story, the oldest story in the world, to, uh, to show that this is a timeless problem. And I'll let you support the Village Dove and hopefully pick up a copy on your way out. I'd love to sign it for you and personalize it for you as a, or as a gift to someone else. Uh, I, I joke that this is a, a gift for your best friend or your worst enemy. So, uh, And also please support a, a local bookshop as well by, by, uh, by buying a book and, and, and learn about what the Epic of Gilgamesh, this oldest story in the world, has to say about civility and the timelessness of this problem today. But um, raise your hand if you've heard the story of uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's story of um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This is a this is a more familiar one, but it's a it's a really it's a really provocative one that that illustrates the timelessness of this problem. That the problem originates not in any technology, not in any public leader, not in any law or public policy, but in the human spirit, a part of the human personality that we all share. I love this story of, of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So. Dr. Jekyll is this prestigious, illustrious, wealthy physician in Edinburgh, Scotland. And, uh, but he struggles with these base lusts, 
by night that he just can't rid himself of. So he decides to invent this potion that he drinks by night and transforms into this barbaric, subhuman, monstrous, cruel Mr. Hyde who runs around by night ravaging people, attacking people, murdering people, stealing from people, just wreaking havoc on, on society. And Dr. Jekyll thinks that he's found a solution to this problem. He, comp he can compartmentalize, he can give life to Hyde by night and keep his pristine reputation by day. And yet, all is not so perfect. Dr. Um, Jekyll realizes that the more that he drinks the potion and gives life by night to the monstrous, barbaric, evil Mr. Hyde, the stronger the impulses become. And then he eventually, even spontaneously, is able to transform into Mr. Hyde without drinking the potion at all. The more he gives life and animates and acts on those impulses, desires, soon Mr. Hyde um, overtakes Dr. Jekyll and, and he be permanently becomes Mr. Hyde. And it's a powerful metaphor for, again, the way that there is this duality in the human spirit. There's this great line from Robert Louis Stevenson's famous novel where he says, you know, it cannot be said that I was either Jekyll or Hyde because I was irrevocably, irredeemably both. And we all are. We have a little bit of good and a little bit of bad in each of us. And, and I, love, I, love, I love how the story of um, the, the grandfather, the Cherokee grandfather, who's talking with his grandson one day. And he says to his grandson, within, within you, grandson, there are two wolves. One wolf is charitable, benevolent, gracious, hospitable, and kind. And the other wolf is malicious, cruel, barbaric, monstrous, inhumane. And they're constantly fighting for primacy within you, grandson. And the grandson says, which wolf will win, grandfather? And the grandfather says, whichever wolf you feed. And we feed these wolves through our daily actions in the ways great and the ways small, in our everyday thoughts, everyday habits, everyday decisions, we are feeding one of these wolves, one of these parts of us, the social, the selfish, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, Enkidu or Gilgamesh, as you'll, as you'll learn, for those of you who read the book or as, you, as you'll read it, uh, discover if you, if, you, if you take the book home, that, that there is this duality to the human spirit that makes this a timeless challenge, that just as no single uh, technology like, like Facebook or, or, or uh, what Elon Musk is doing with the Twitter algorithm, or, or you know, it's easy to want to blame Donald Trump or what, the pandemic or, or whatever the, 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 th the thing is, it's easy to blame and externalize the cause. But the cause is actually within each of us. And that's important to recognize because if we misdiagnose the problem, we will misdiagnose, we'll misprescribe solutions, and we'll miss opportunities, we'll overlook opportunities that we each have to be part of the solution in our everyday. And that is a core message of my book, that we have way more power, each one of us in this room, to either contribute and exacerbate the problem of division, of loneliness, of despair, of extremism in our world right now, or to be part of the solution, to infuse it with hope and light and life, which is what my mother taught me and how, what she modeled for me and uh, my brothers and I, and, and what my grandmother before her modeled for us too. And in my book, I, I talk about this idea in the final chapter of my book, it's called the mellifluous echo of the magnanimous soul. And it's this idea that one person, through their daily acts and the accumulation of their daily acts, daily decisions, and just how they live their lives, can put into play virtuous cycles and make the world a better place in small but powerful ways. Our headlines are dominated by stories of generational trauma, of vicious cycles of abuse and bad decision-making. One person's 
selfishness, one person's self-love, one person's decisions to um, indulge in addiction or some sort of compulsion or crime that, that has repercussions for those around them across time and across place. There are powerful um, stories of this. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of uh, J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy or Tara Westover's Educated. And there are two great memoirs that are, are just out in that vein. One is called Troubled by a, a gentleman named Robert Henderson who grew up in foster care. And he experienced firsthand and, 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 and um, you know, almost irre irrevocable early trauma because of people's selfishness. He was abandoned by the first, this is how he opens his book there, that he says, you know, my name is Robert Kim Henderson, and my name was given to me by my, by my three primary care caregivers, all of whom abandoned me. And there are many reasons they abandoned him, but it's, it's because of selfishness. They, 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 that, of course, put him, and then there's another, another great memoir um, just out called Motorhome Prophecies, uh, written by Carrie Sheffield, who was uh, raised in a home of... Um, uh, uh, of a Mormon fundamentalist gentleman who thought he was a prophet from God destined to be president of the United States who traveled him and his eight kids across the country um, prophesying the good news of his 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 presidential campaign and and it was a uh, it's a story of religious fundamentalism and mental illness and how that compounded to a really traumatic life for her and and all these stories educated hillbilly elegy um, troubled motorhome prophecies are, are stories of people who are able to overcome their trauma and we we, we admire those stories. They're beautiful stories when they're, they're kind of modern day rags to riches stories, but that doesn't undermine the trauma and, and the hurt that that was caused to them by people who made bad decisions that hurt them. And we know those stories, those stories of vicious cycles of generational trauma. But we, what we are less familiar with, the story type that is too infrequently told are, are stories of the inverse where one person's light and life and joy and ebullience and effervescence has a cumulative virtuous uh, uh, effect, where they, 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 through their successive decisions, they bring light and joy and life wherever they go. And this is what I call, um, the, the, my, my grandmother was one of these people. She, she had a gift um, of, of, you know, she just, every single interaction she had with another person she treated with profound reverence. She said, so this is a gift. And uh, you know, it didn't matter who the person was. It was the person she sat next to on the airplane. It was her male lady. It was the, the cashier at the grocery store. She just treated that with such a sacred, this is a gift. And this is what she maximized every single interaction. And she made the most of it. And I will be honest. She, you know, she, she would smile, she would ask them how they were, she was, had a, a, an earnest interest in, in the well-being and the stories of others, and she perplexed a lot of people. You know, she, people are like, who is this blonde, you know, beautiful woman talking to me? What does she want from me? They're, 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 it perplexed a lot of people, <laughs> but she blessed countless more. And that was just how she, how she lived her life. Uh, and, and I talk about how you know, Aristotle has this concept of the magnanimous soul. Aristotle said that the magnanimous soul is someone whose soul is so well-constituted, well-ordered, well-composed, where they have their priorities in order. They know who they are. Um, they, 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 and they are able to forget about themselves and step out in confidence and strength into the world and be utterly focused on others. And that is, that is the example that my grandmother embodied. She was a magnanimous soul. And through her life, she created a mellifluous echo, a beautiful echo, a virtuous cycle that, that made the world a better place. She modeled that lifestyle, that countercultural lifestyle for her five children, all of whom went forth to become the social glue in their families and their community and live their lives according to a similar logic. And each of them had, you know, two to, two to four children. And, 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 and I have, you know, 18 grand, uh, sorry, cousins who, who are similarly, you know, zealous about the human social project, zealously extroverted. And we stay in touch with people and we're other oriented and we're hospitable. At least we aspire to be. We're nowhere... I, I'm nowhere as extroverted as my mother and certainly nowhere as extroverted as my grandmother, who is an order of magnitude more extroverted than my mother. But 
that was just a powerful example to us, the way that they lived their lives, that the, the magnanimous, the mag mellifluous echo of the magnanimous soul, that is, that is something that we can all aspire to. The small things, the small everyday things have big consequences. And I hope that people walk away tonight and walk away from reading my book with an enhanced appreciation of the power we each have to either, again, be a part of the problem or be a part of the solution in our everyday. And using our lives to sow seeds that make other people feel seen and known and loved. And in sowing those seeds, that's an act of faith. We may never know this side of eternity what fruit is born from those small acts of charity and kindness? I know we will never see this of eternity, the number of people and the, and the good that, that came from my grandmother's life and legacy because of the way she sowed and give and gave and continued to give um, her entire life. You know, I, I, in my book, I tell the story of the front porch. I, I talk about I left in, I left Washington, D.C. totally in despair and, and cynical about our world and our division and, and human nature. And I came home and said to my husband one day, about a year into my service, I'm done with government. I'm done with D.C. Let's move to Indiana, I said. And I don't have roots here, but he does. He's from a tiny little town just outside of Fort Wayne where he, um, he, 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 he laughs that he passed more Amish buggies on his way to school than cars, a tiny little town. And it was my decision to move here. We talked about one day moving here to, to raise a family of our own and be closer to his family. And, um, and I just, in my mind, wanted to be, I, want, I, I wanted the um, bucolic pastures and rolling hills and, and you know, peaceful farmland of, of, of the American Midwest. That, that, was, that was the draw. That was the pull for me here. And my husband said to me, okay, sounds good. We'll move to Indiana no take backs. And a few months later, we were here. We've been here six years and we, we love it. We have a, a great community, a beautiful home and two, two children of our own and, and expecting our third this fall. And um, when we first moved here, it didn't quite feel like home. And it took one person who came up to us after church one day and said, hi, I'm Joanna Taff. Would you like to porch with us? And I'd never heard the word porch used as a verb before we went and it was and it was a, a curious uh, thing that I saw it was it was really subversive it was countercultural it was I and that day Joanna had had people across race politics religion class geography on her porch not to have a structured dialogue across difference but just to be seen and known and loved in the fullness of our humanity and just to just to be people. In, a, in, a, in an era and in a world that wants to us to assign value to one aspect of who we are and essentialize us, we were able to be just, just who, we, who we wanted to be that day, who, who we were in the fullness of who we are. And I realized that there is something very subversive to that in creating an, in creating an oasis from the division and the, and, the, and, and the atomization and hostility in giving a place for people to be seen and known and loved. Um, that's revolutionary. And there are people across the country doing that, and we can too. And we don't have to have a front porch to do it. It's not about the front porch. I just use it as a, as a metaphor. It's not about the porch. It's about, it's about having the disposition of civility, of wanting to transform outsider to insider, stranger into a friend. And my grandmother, she didn't have a front porch. She had a, her front patio set, her old historic antique cast iron patio set where she would just you know, sit and pass the time and, and whoever happened to pass by, she would wave, invite them to tea, invite them to a meal. And, and she always had, you know, little nibbles and, and beverages ready at the ready to invite someone if they wanted to sit, to stay a while. And we can do that too. It's not about what we have. It's about how we use what we have, whether it's just your front lawn or your stoop or, or a coffee shop or, or hosting supper clubs or dinner parties. It's, 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 it's just about using what we have and having disposition of civility, of seeing people in the fullness of who they are and treating them with the decency and respect that we are owed and owed to others by virtue of our personhood. And that's what civility is. It's the art of human flourishing. Um, and so I'm thrilled that you guys are 
here tonight to talk about this conversation uh, about, you know, what does what does having more civility like? What what was a civility initiative? What, what can that look like here in Fishers? And and I'd love to hear from you. So I want to open it up for uh, for conversation. I'd love to uh, invite you into this dialogue. That I I've thought about this problem for some time to some extent my whole life. I've been working on this project for about a decade and I have I have some ideas. I don't have all the answers though. I, I don't think any book uh, worth its salt should you know pose itself as having all the answers. If anything, I think it clarifies the questions. And, I, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, what's on your mind? What are the anxiety struggles that you have? And, and where do you think that we should go from here tonight? So thank you again for having me, Fishers, and, and really honored, really thrilled to be here. So Lexi, I think what we're gonna do, we'll um, start out, I'm just gonna come up and join you here for a minute. Couple of um, things that I think that I would like to do to clarify some of the points that you've made, and then I'll come out and we'll be happy to get your, um, get your questions, your comments, your concerns. Uh, my name's Jeff Worrell. Uh, I'm over on the other side of the river in Carmel. And uh, John DeLucia, good friend, John DeLucia, and a great caretaker of this community, uh, came to our first uh, seminar that we had in Carmel and wanted to bring this to Fisher. So I uh, congratulate all of you. I appreciate you being here because uh, what we hear tonight is so important and something that we can take home with us and use. And so would you like to have a seat? Are yes. you comfortable sitting down? Yes. And um, so that kind of leads me to my first um, question for you, Lexi, because one of the things that we want to do is to leave here tonight with some good things that we can take home. I promised the people in Carmel that we would define what is civility. So as you lean across the uh, back fence and uh, your neighbor says, what'd you do last night? You can say, I went to a talk all about civility. Well, what is civility? So can you start out? I've heard you talk about the difference between being polite which my mom just this weekend said, well, I'm polite. Does that mean I'm civil? I said, well, not necessarily, mom. What's the difference between being polite and being civil? Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, that's a core argument of my book, that there is this essential distinction between civility and politeness. Um, and often people conflate the two. They use them interchangeably. Uh, whether And there are two loud camps, loud voices, today. Is that me? You hear a little, looks like, sounds like wind. Um, one camp says, you know, we need, we just need to get back to the good old days of gentility and, and, and politeness and civility. And if we can get back to those golden days and we'll, we'll revive comity and harmony in, in Congress and modern American life and move past this division. So they, they, they long for this golden age. They, they want more civility and politeness in American public life. They think that's the answer. There's another contingent that says, no, Civility and politeness is the problem. They are tools of the patriarchy. They're tools of, of white supremacists, of people in positions of power to keep the powerless powerless. And we need less civility and politeness. We need, we need to burn it all to the ground in order to achieve greater justice and equity in our world today. And, and so both these, can, the, both these camps, whether they want more civility and politeness, less civility and politeness, both of them make what I think is an error and conflate these two ideas, use them interchangeably, when I think there's an essential distinction between, the, between them. I argue that politeness is technique. It is um, manners. It's etiquette. It's external stuff. It's, it's the conduct. Whereas civility is not external, like politeness, it's internal. It's not just compliance with social norms and expectations. It's a disposition of the heart, an orientation towards others that sees others as our moral equals who are worthy of a bare minimum of respect just by virtue of our shared moral status as members of the human community, just by virtue of the Imago Dei. And that crucially, Sometimes actually respecting someone, actually loving someone requires being impolite. It means breaking the rules of propriety and etiquette in order to tell an uncomfortable truth, to have a difficult conversation, to risk 
offending someone, hurting someone's feelings, that politeness might want to sweep that difference under the rug, sweep the discomfort under the rug, or, or pass it, kick it down the can, kick the can down the road a little bit for, for someone else, or to be, to just be taken care of another day. And, and civility says, no, I respect you enough to take you and your ideas serious, or your actions serious enough to tell you when you're making a mistake, even if that might hurt you, even that it's going to be uncomfortable for, for me or for us. Um, that's a way to love and respect someone. And really actually being polite and coddling someone in a, in a bad behavior or in a mistruth is, is a, an act of selfishness. It's, it's easier for us to not have that conversation. It's easier just kind of to preserve the status quo, but that's not actually loving them. So um, all right, this essential distinction between civility and politeness um, is, is it's important because we need to know as a society, as, as, as Carmel, as Fishers, what are we aiming for? And I think we ought not aim for mere politeness. Don't just settle with doing and saying the nice and the right things. Let's get our hearts in the right place. Let's actually cultivate the disposition of wanting to respect others. And, and that means having honest and open conversations about the things that we hold dear but deeply disagree with. And not just pretending those differences don't exist. That's patronizing. That's not respecting others. It's saying, no, we have deeply held values that, that we might, we might see, see the world differently. But I respect you enough to take your ideas seriously. And I'm not going to allow how much I disagree or even hate your idea to allow me to disrespect or degrade you as a person. And um, she did. Uh, I presented Lexi with a, uh, with a concept in a kind of a <laughs> civility code that I was working on. And she didn't like some of it. And she was uh, very willing to uh, tell me what needed to be corrected. And I appreciate it. So what is, so maybe, I don't know, using that as a, as a small example, but how do I know when someone is being civil and, but yet we're in this disagreement, is there anything about harm or punishment or you, let's get into some of that. How do I know when you're actually being civil to me? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So civility, both demands action in some cases, but also takes certain action off the table. So uh, I, I have this very handy chart of common uh, or familiar instances in daily life in my introduction of my book to clarify this distinction. Uh, and you know, I have a, 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 the situation, then I say, what's the polite response? What's the civil response? So say, for example, you have your performance view cut review coming up and you really want a promotion um, and your boss comes into work and has an absolutely terrible haircut. The polite thing might be to say, boss, you look great, ravishing. The haircut is so becoming of you. Like, you know, you have your performance view like coming up that, later that week, you're gunning for the promotion, you're gunning for the raise. You flatter, you're obsequious. That is self-serving. That is not loving, that is not respecting your boss. It's clearly nakedly self-interested -interest, because you have something to possibly gain by buttering your boss up and flattering him and ingratiating yourself to him in advance of your meeting later that week. The civil thing would be to not say anything, not lie. Don't pretend to have a view just to ingratiate yourself and not patronize them or find something else that you can honestly compliment if you if you want to like oh I love your tie Jeff you know like I do I do like your tie it's beautiful though um, so so that's that's one example another example is say you're at a dinner party and someone next to you is making a faux pas for example they are um, they're taking a sip out of the bowl drinking like soup, a bowl meant to be for fingers. You know, maybe it's a fancy party. I know not every, every restaurant or dinner party has finger bowls anymore. But, um, you know, the, the polite person, the polite response would be to notice the faux pas and like smugly say, you know, that's, that's clearly a parvenu, clearly someone who doesn't know the rules of etiquette and politeness and, and use that faux pas as a way to feel smug and self-righteous, like you know what the rules are and, and there is an outsider and then just kind of relish in that, in that self, sort of smug self-righteousness. A polite thing to do, that, that, that's the polite thing to do. The civil thing to do might be to instead, you know, quietly pull them aside and say, hey, by the way, you know, just 
this is this is what that's for. It's for fingers. It's not actually soup, and and that that's that it might be uncomfortable. You know, you know, you risk embarrassing them. You risk embarrass like it was awkward, but you're preventing them from repeating that faux pas later. Like it's a it's a telling an, an unco- having an uncomfortable conversation, having an uncomfortable. Uh, telling an uncomfortable truth for the sake of actually respecting someone and not allowing the rules of propriety and etiquette to be this tool of division because that's often what rules of politeness become. They become these things that let the in-group, let the people who have knowledge of the rules feel really self-righteous. They're they're tools of division and, and separating ourselves from those that don't know. And um and that's that's not good. I think we generally should keep the norms that foster the art of human flourishing, that foster community and conversation, that bridge divides, and discard the ones that that foster divides, that foster that foster difference. And then, yeah. And and the one point that really struck me in that example, of course, you go a little bit further with the um, the queen or somebody, yeah. you know, what she did. But um, but I did notice in your civil example, the it was a private conversation. There was no um, intent to embarrass yes. or to hurt, yes. or is that correct? Right, and well, I, and I, I, I love, I'll, I'll tell that story because that is what I'm, what I'm thinking. That's so illustrative of this distinction between civility and politeness. That uh, it's 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 uh, said that Queen Victoria was hosting the Queen of Persia to a state dinner, and uh, the you know this is Victorian England, Queen Victoria, the queen of the most you know arcane, arbitrary, like tight. You know, social norms and, and manners like in history, Victorian England. And, and she was the queen of that era uh, and the queen of those rules. But um, the, the queen of Persia sat down and did the unthinkable. She broke one of these rules and took the bowl intended for fingers and tipped it to her lips and drank it like soup. And what did the queen do? She picked up her own bowl and tipped it to her lips and, and drank as well. She broke, you know, her own rule of propriety and etiquette. Why? for the sake of making her guest feel welcome and not unduly alienating her, making her feel uncomfortable, and for the sake of relationship, for the sake of trust. And we need to know the art of, uh, the art of civility, the art of human flourishing too. When is it appropriate to depart from decorum, to depart from propriety, for the sake of actually having honest, authentic, real, vibrant, mutually beneficial relationships? Yeah, wonderful story. Before I go down, <clears throat> excuse me, before I go out into the audience and we um, hear from this great group that we have with us, can you, um, you've alluded to it several times, I've heard the key words, can you just give us the definition of civility as a, um, as someone who is just a fan of your book, but not an expert, people always ask me, well, what is civility? And I cannot describe it as well as you can, but you have a couple of great definitions in the book that I carry around with me and repeat to people. So what can this group take home with them to tell their spouse or their neighbor, well, what is civility? Civility is threefold. One, it is the art of human flourishing. Two, it is a disposition of the heart, an orientation to others, a way of seeing others as our moral equals who are worthy of respect by virtue of our shared moral status as, as members of, of the human community. And it's, it's not, three, it's not politeness. It's not just blindly following manners and, 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 and etiquette for its own sake. It's, it's thoughtfully questioning, is, this, is following this rule, is it going to uh, help me? live well and act well and engage well with others? Or is it uh, going to divide? Is it going to foster uh, foster division and foster animosity? Um, and, and civility is third, the bare minimum of respect that we are owed and owed to others by virtue of our shared dignity and, and personhood as human beings. Very good. Are you ready for some questions? Yes, I'd love to. All I'd right, love to hear from uh, everyone. Let me uh, be Phil Donahue for uh, the old people in the room who remember who Phil Donahue is uh, or was. Um, okay, and, and we really, got right. really, really quickly. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, is, uh, did everyone here sign up and register? Are there any any, any walk-ins here? We, we would just love to make sure that we're able to stay in touch with you. And and you know, John, as he leads this initiative going forward, um, love to love to be here. So, any 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 walk-ins here, or are we all all registered and signed up? We're really thrilled that you're all here. Thank you so much. Whoops. We're not going to let anyone leave. So, uh, Roz would like to ask our first question tonight. 
Hi, Roz. Hi there, Lexi. Thank you. I'm Roz Harris. I'm the Vice President of League of Women Voters in Hamilton County. I uh, enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. I think I have a question. It's kind of convoluted. Opinion versus civility. If I'm being civil, is this my opinion about what flourishing is for you? Is this, you know, is my perspective? How does my own personal perspective and opinion, because couldn't civility be a point of view? Yeah. That was not civil. Yes, that was civil. I don't know. The, the question in there is like, how do I tease out my opinion and my perspective from what is civility? It's a great question. Thank you, Thank Roz. You, Roz. So actually uh, on my handy chart about the difference between civility and politeness, a third example I give is say you're at dinner with family and you're with someone, a family member or a loved one that has a viewpoint that you absolutely despise. Um, and the civil thing to do might be to um, you know, find other areas of conversation, not focus on the area of disagreement. Uh, that that's perfectly okay. Like one argument in my book that I make is that we've actually allowed our divisions and our you know political views to become all encompassing and, and invade all aspects of our lives, and that we're too quick to jump to the hot button issues. Like you know, what's your view on the pandemic or what's your view on the vaccine or Donald Trump or abortion? Like you, do, you just go right to the heart of it. It's like people are like leading with those divisive conversations as opposed to finding an area of commonality, a shared interest and establishing that trust first. So anyway, I think it's perfectly okay to, you know, just with this, with this family member who has an idea that you disagree with to find an area that that's not the area of disagreement to talk about. Or it could involve saying, you know, I, I view it differently, you know, here's why, or, um, and, and that's, 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 and, and, and not letting it to get to the place that the, the place where it becomes this existential fight to the death, where you feel like you have to hash out every argument of, of either side, or, uh, the civil person might, you know, ask questions, honest, earnest questions, not to expose, not to humiliate, but just, you know, curiosity, like, and, you know, civility demands, that we treat every, everyone with a bare minimum of respect that we are owed because of our human dignity. And that requires seeing others in the fullness of who they are. And that each of us is infinitely, irreducibly complex. We come to our views of the world for many different reasons. We each have our own unique stories, our, our unique experiences. And, and staying open and curious to people's stories, not just saying, you know, you view the vaccine, you, your if you, opinion on the vaccine is this, therefore you're an evil person. Um, saying, you know, tell me more about how you came to that view. Tell me the story behind it and just kind of getting to, getting to know who they are. Because even if you disagree with their conclusion, you can still respect often how they got there, you know, or, or even just grow an appreciation of who they are and, 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 and respect more who they are. And, you know, there are lots of people in this space of civility and civil dialogue who say, you know, all, all, all ideas are equal and should be equally tolerated and respected. And I actually don't, that's not what I argue for. I don't, I don't even necessarily think that's true, but I think every single person deserves respect, regardless of their views. Don't You don't have to respect all views equally, but respect all people equally. Yeah, good, sure, okay. Well, I'll just stay right here, I've got another one. Yeah, hi, I'm Frank Leonard. I'm big fans of John DeLucia, and I actually invited Mayor, uh, Jim, former Mayor Jim Brainerd, and he said he knew you, but he had a conflict, so he couldn't come tonight. But uh, I've got two questions for you, the first, it feels like a lot of teenagers struggle with a lot of anxiety. Can you comment on how lack of civility may have contributed to that feeling that overwhelms them oftentimes? And then secondly, can you comment on etiquette with cell phones? I mean, I'm a victim of my own bad habits yeah. because I'm always on my phone, even when I'm in a conversation with somebody. I know it's disrespectful, but do you have a tip for guys like me? Yeah, no, it's it's a great question. So I'll I'll answer both those questions with um with reference to a new book that's coming out. It's called The Anxious Generation. It's coming out in just just a week or so by my friend Anna, uh, who's been a great supporter of my work and this project of my book uh, named Jonathan Hate Height, Height um, at, at NYU. And his book is on 
the emotional, social, psychological collapse of Gen Z because of cell phones, because of technology, because of social media. And it's devastating. He actually you know, invited me to read and comment on early versions of his manuscript. And um, it was it was devastating for the the, the synopsis is you should, you know, definitely read the book, especially if you have kids or are an educator. I mean, we all have young people in our lives and it's, it's important to, to know what the evidence is saying about this. But, you know, the, 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 the synopsis is that, um, social media and, um, you know, ad- addictive use of cell phones is harmful for young girls, primarily because of comparison, body image issues, eating disorders, and, and just kind of the, the the ubiquity of being surrounded by a certain ideal of beauty and status and aspiration and, and that being, you know, not really what reality is and us never living up to that perfectly. And that's that's a cause of a lot of the psychological challenges of young girls with young boys is not as much the comparison and eating disorders associated with, you know, Instagram culture. It's actually the opportunity costs of boys being on social media or gaming and not being outside and playing with friends. So there's a lot of like social and emotional loss that is like friendships that aren't happening and, 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 and fun that's not being had because kids are just alone in dark rooms and playing video games instead. And that is, the, the, these are just a few of, of, of many things that that Dr. Height explores in, in, in this book that um, that speaks to that speaks to the, the the anxious generation, the anxiety of the youths, much more than my book does. Like his whole book is on that side. I, I refer you to that. Um, but to your second question, you know, when I was reading this book about how social media and cell phones were affecting kids, what I encouraged, what I felt really convicted by, and what I encouraged him to explore more and be more heavy handed about in, um, in, in his book is that yes, we should be cognizant as parents and schools. Like he's all about banning cell phones in schools entirely for, for middle schoolers and high schoolers, zero. And I, I'm, I'm for that. <laughs> like, I think that's great just to have a detox, a, a disconnect and you know, the bullying and things that go on. It's just, it's just not good. Um, yes. You know, as, as authority figures, as parents, as educators, we should absolutely care and, and be cognizant of the relationship with, between the student and technology. But what I became so convicted by is how, but when I was reading his, his, his early chapters of this book was how is my conduct modeling for my kids a culture of, of cell phone use? And I was absolutely devastated by that. And, you know, like it, it, just, just thinking about, you know, kids notice when we don't notice. And my baby girl, when not even a year old, I mean, when she was not even a year old, grasping for my phone, like, what is this strange device that my mother's obsessed with? Like, I'm always on my phone, sending emails, taking calls, you know, and and even noticing that my son, Percival, who just turned four yesterday, like, when I'm sending an email or something, he used to try and get my attention. He used to be like, mom, 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 can I, can I, oops, sorry, can I, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? And now he just knows that he can't compete with that. And he will just not wait patiently, which is good. You know, patience is good. But like, it kind of breaks my heart a little bit that he's conditioned. He knows that there's no, you know, his needs are going to have to wait for mama to finish her email in five seconds. You know, like patience is good. But like, I never want my kids to think that they are secondary to an impersonal object or that, you know, to my work or to whatever it is. I always want my children to know that they are the most, there are other important things in life, but they're the most important thing to me. And I want to live my, I don't want to just say that, say, I love you. I want to live a life that loves them and loves them well. And um, so anyway, I uh, advice for you is just, you know, keep that in mind, you know, not just like, I, it's true for all of us, not just with how we use our phones, but how we, how we live our lives in general is the greatest testament to our ideals and our values and who we are. And that's the greatest challenge and vulnerability to me who's written a book about the gift of human dignity and and about civility because unfortunately I'm human just like everyone here just like everyone else who's ever lived and walked this earth and I fall short of my own ideals that I've written an entire book about every day countless times each day right and 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 what's this is kind of the peril of the world we live in right now where unfortunately someone captures on social media someone on their worst day right and that's all of a sudden on the internet and people are viciously piling on and shaming them and f- get, they're getting fired and they're, they're being expelled from society and, and getting disinvited. And, and that's, that's very unfortunate for, for so many reasons. You know, things are being rehashed from, from years ago and, and, and weaponized as if they're contemporaneous. And that 
It doesn't allow for people to change and grow and, and to be human. Alexander Pope, the uh, English poet said, to err is to be human, to forgive is divine. And unfortunately, in this post-Christian era we have, we've kept Christian notions of condemnation, of conviction, but we've lost Christian notions of compassion, of redemption, of forgiveness. And, and that, that's so true in our society that we are, we're very ruthless. We, you know, we're quick to see evidence and condemn. You know, the wholeness of who you are is, by, is captured in this one tweet, this one video, this one you know, bad thing that you did, as opposed to saying, you know, we're all people and we're infinitely complex and we're all imperfect, and we're going to have good days and bad days. We're going to do good things and some bad things. And that's unfortunate, but it's okay. It's, it's just what it means to be human. And, and what matters is owning when we've made a mistake and trying to move forward uh, and not dwelling on it. But unfortunately, we want to, we want to dwell on it as a society. Like, I, I'm, I'm racked with mom guilt every time, like, you know, I, I recognize I've been on my phone too often with my kids on a given day. And then I, you know, I, all I can do is resolve, like, let's do better, let's do better tomorrow. That's all we can do. Thank you, Lexi. All right, next question right here. Go ahead. Yeah, Brad Boyd. I'm with Qantas International, uh, our global headquarters here in Indy. We've oh, great. Got a, I didn't know that. That's um, awesome. Yeah, the service to uh, others, or I think you said orientation to others yeah. is what our members, yes, they're all volunteers you. in their communities, and we're in about uh, 85 countries around the world yes. with about a half million uh, members and everything. Wow. But that said, all these organizations are declining in membership because we just are too dang busy to get involved. So I really admire what Jeff's doing in Carmel, yes. the Carmel resident, in terms of just raising the awareness of civility and everything. And this may be a little dangerous with a couple of politicians in the room or whatever, uh -huh. but I was really intrigued with your concept of duality and it really got me thinking through. And obviously the first thing is to go to the very top. Our two presidential candidates are probably the best examples in decades of the duality. They both have the good and the bad uh, <laughs> parts of them and everything. And But I was listening to the State of the Union address, and I think I've listened to everyone every year, and it just seems to me that um, we've gone to the point of where they become more like political speeches rather than I remember the days of great orators and really being inspired listening to a State of the Union. So my question is, do you think that we're too far down the path to ever return to uh, something to aspire to uh, have our politicians? Obviously, Jeff's yeah. doing his part trying to uh, raise the stakes there, but um, I'm just concerned for our future generations when everything is really attack mode. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, it's, it's a timeless question, too. Like what, is, what is the relationship between the demos, the public, and the leader? And, you know, which comes first? Does a virtuous leader create a virtuous people or does a virtuous people support and elect a virtuous leader? You know, that if we're ever dissatisfied with our leaders in office, we have, we have to look in the mirror. You know, they, that politicians for better or for worse, are often a reflection of the people who put them there, who support them. And, um, and this, is, this is a core message of my book, that this is the beauty of a democracy. The citizen is prior to the regime, to the leader. It is a citizen-oriented regime. And that if we're dissatisfied, like that, that we have more power than we realize to, to, to um, you know, support who we want to support. And that this is especially true at the local level, which is why I am so honored to partner with people like Jeff Worrell and, and John DeLucia and, and others across the country who are, you know, school board presidents, city managers who are writing to me saying, how do we, how, what does this look like here in, in the hills outside of Austin or in, in rural Wisconsin and our, in our school board here? Like, and I, I love this because that is where, that is where, you know, a matter of a few votes do matter, right? It's really overwhelming to, to think about national politics right now. It's like, oh my gosh, where do I even start? And where should you start as local? You know, find and support locally the leaders that, that you know will embody the ideals that you want your kids to see model, that you want to see instantiated in your community. Uh, and that's why I haven't even... I don't even know if anyone in Congress has my book. I haven't sent it to them. I hope they do. If you know a congressperson, send it to them. But like, I, I, I left DC for a reason. And, I, and I, I relish and I'm focusing on working with local leaders for a reason because that is, you know, states and, and communities are the laboratories of democracy. And, and this is where change begins right here in our, in our homes and in our, in our communities. Um, 
and in our in our localities and our municipalities. So um, I would take the question and invert it. What can you do? Who are you supporting and who are you encouraging to, to, to get involved locally and, and to be the change and, and to instantiate these ideas and values now? And just a word about civil society. I have a whole chapter in my book dedicated to the link between our everyday social norms and civil society. And so civil society is this, is this beautiful kind of third space. It's not quite government, not quite the privacy of the home. It's this, it's this, this quasi public sphere um, that Alexis de Tocqueville, when he was, he was a French aristocrat, when he came to America in the 1830s, he was on an official assignment from the French government to study America's criminal justice system. He, he, he went to you know, states like Pennsylvania and others, uh, studying, he went to their prisons to, to, uh, on this commission from the French government, but he had an unofficial mission as well. He was fascinated by this thing called democracy, fascinated and terrified, I should say, because democracy had, was sweeping the world. It had the, 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 the American Revolution happened, and shortly after, a very violent, bloody, irrational thing called the French Revolution happened that brutalized and, and, and slaughtered in the street many, many, many French aristocrats, including very nearly Tocqueville's parents. They missed the guillotine by hours. They were set to be executed that day, and for some reason at the last minute their execution by guillotine was stayed. So he had you know, generational trauma in his in his in his blood from democracy from the excesses of the demos of, of the passions of the people running rampant and, and 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 causing injustice as a result and so he came to america you know skeptical like what is this thing called democracy and in his book that everyone here should should spend time with called democracy in america he he paints the most sophisticated and important picture of of america and democracy. It's the best book written on either America or democracy ever written. I'm very comfortable saying that. And he paints a picture of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And one, one of the good things he observes about America is this remarkable tendency to just come together and get stuff done at the, at the local level, the, the level of the citizen. He said, you know, in my native France and in England, when there's a problem, they, they write a letter to their local official in the government. They say, government, do something here. Like, take care of this. And in America, that was not the case. They, people saw needs, and they said, hey, help me. And they just rose to the occasion and got things done. And that, Tocqueville notes, is the lifeblood of, of, and the beauty of, of American democracy. What, what makes it work is this mediating, and these mediating bodies like Kiwanis International that are so essential to again meeting the, mediating the the, the the relationship between the between the local uh, the individual and and the state and they they get stuff done like thank you for your service for to, to so many worthy projects around the world I was a Rotary scholar I don't know if you're I hope you're not competitive with Rotary but but uh, you know I went to London uh, the London School of Economics on a Rotary scholarship they they funded my scholarship to study education and public policy um, and and I've spoken to hundreds. At least, at least many, many, many dozens of Rotary clubs around the world about, you know, about about these ideas and and, and some of my my volunteer work, and um and one one argument I make, you know, you mentioned that you're dwindling in membership, and that's a really compelling story that a lot of people. I'm I'm, I'm sure that and I know that is true at a at a literal level that that membership in Rotary clubs are in Qantas and are, are declining. We're not bowling together anymore, right? Like a very famous essay turned book written 20 years ago by a Harvard scientist, a political scientist named Robert Putnam, argued, look, Tocqueville said this thing called civil society matters. We should be worried that we're not doing stuff together anymore. Civil society is crumbling. And we need, he sounded the alarm on the decline of civil society. And what I do in my chapter is actually contextualize Putnam. And, you know, he, Putnam makes the argument that unfortunately we're just watching television too much and we're not giving, we're not, we're not having people over for dinner. We're not joining rotary clubs. We're not bowling. When he goes through a litany of all, we're not volunteering. We're not a litany of all these different ways that American civic life is, is in peril. And he blames television, you know, like just like Jonathan Haidt um, uh, locates a lot of our mental uh, anxieties and illness and, and, and stressors and social media, like that's what that's what Putnam does with with television, and the and the, and, and then a generation before him, uh, a guy named uh, Robert Nisbet wrote a book called The Quest for Community, and he was worried about the decline of civil society, and blamed war. 
He was worried about total war, crumbling families and communities, and, and the overreach of state, crumbling civil society. And you know, a uh, few centuries before that was a guy named Adam Ferguson, who wrote a book called An Essay into the Inquiry and Origins of Civil Society. And, and Adam Ferguson was worried about commerce. He was worried about free trade and wealth and growing interest in luxuries, how that was crippling. It was, it was, it was giving life to too much self-love and self-interest and making people more self-interested and less communal, communally interested. And that was that was going to cripple civil, civil and civilized society. And a thousand years before that, not a thousand, like 800 years before that, uh, uh, a North African, a Muslim scholar named Ibn Khaldun, wrote uh, wrote about this idea too. He had, he had his concept of civil society and he also was worried about commerce, you know, centuries before that even. And so there's always been, you know, Aristotle wrote about civil society 2,000 years ago and, and threats to civil society. And so what's interesting is, this is a core argument in my book, there's nothing new under the sun, that the human condition is the human condition. And there will be epiphenomenon that stress, that are stressors to human community, that exacerbate self-love, that, that diminish maybe threaten, destabilize the social project, but we're resilient. We are socially resilient, we are communally resilient, we, we are a doggedly social species and that we, we prevail, that, that that's not going away. No single politician, technology, epiphenomena is going to eradicate the human social spirit, that it's there, it's not going anywhere. We, will, we have that longing for relationship and community and so don't lose hope. Kiwanis International, all that to say. I'm coming over to this side now. Um, while I'm walking over here, uh, in 2017, the speaker uh, asked Congress to sign a civility pledge. Have you seen that? There were um, not even half of the uh, members of Congress that signed it. So I happened to run into that when I was doing research on you, Lexi. Anyone over here have a question? I was trying to be fair. I was coming over to this side. Okay, I'll go back over to the other side. John has a question. No? We're good. Uh, are you good? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How about um, where do you stand on compromise? How does compromise affect civility or where does it fall in that? I've had uh, several of our politicians over in Carmel want um, to know about compromise. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great question. That's the, that's the kind of defining idea of a democracy that you're not going to get everything you want all of the time. And when you don't, you can't just take your marbles and go home. That you you stay present, like you 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 lose an election, you lose a political battle, you lose a vote on this bill or that policy idea. That um, you're not going to get everything that you want at at all times, and that you still have to stay, you know, stay committed to the shared vision, this uh, this joint project of self governance that we are all part of as citizens in this great country, as citizens in American democracy. And so there is a lot of criticism that public leaders who, who compromise, who, who try to find a middle ground, they take flack for um, you know, being wishy-washy, right? having no standards, having no real values, no principles. But there is an art to being able to find commonality even when it feels like you're worlds apart. And that, that you know, the reality is we have far more in common as, as citizens, as, as human beings than we have that differentiates us. And what does it look like to lead with that in mind? To lead not just for the people who voted for you, but to lead for everyone, to lead for, um, yeah, so that's, it's a great question. And I'd love to hear from you. What do you guys think of compromise? Do you think it's this wishy-washy? Yes, let's hear, let's hear from the audience, yeah. Look, a couple of contributions. So that brings up the, the subject of accountability. And that's what we're seeing a lack of. I feel like uh, when there's sufficient accountability, society is civilized. When you reflect on history, uh, that's a hypothesis, but also want to take a minute to push back on your kind of foundation of uh, when you go out to society, you deal with people, see them as morally um, equal and treat them with respect. And I don't see it that way. I treat people with respect out of respect for myself because we're surrounded by liars, cheats, and thieves on a daily basis, and I don't know who's who. So when I go out, I just treat them with respect under the assumption maybe they are, but I do that out of respect for myself. So I don't think it's it's honest. I, I'm not going to say I respect everybody ever. They have to go through certain uh, little roles for me 
to give them that, but I treat them with respect. Yeah, it's a, it's a great it's, it's a great insight. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing your contribution. So, in my book, I argue that civility is a good is a twofold good. It is both an inherent good and it is an instrumental good. And what I mean by I'll start with instrumental first. What I mean by an instrumental good, I mean that civility is what supports a democracy. It's what supports peaceful coexistence across differences. So it supports across time and place this thing called life with others. So, and that, that's an instrumental good that 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 it has these external. It, it allows us to have friends. It allows us to have you know stay in marriages. You know, it's, it's restraining the self and and not not single mindedly pursuing our own interests, but voluntarily doing so for the sake of a greater good, for the sake of a relationship, for the sake of sacrificing a bit of what we want now for a greater good longer term. So that's an instrumental good that that we, um, you know, we act with civility towards others with decency and respect. And, and as a result, we're allowed to stay in society. We're not expelled and meant to live on, you know, an island away from others, right? Um, but it's also civility, an instrument, an inherent good. And what I mean, what I mean by that, an inherent good means that it's good for its own sake, it is good in and of itself to treat a person with decency and respect. It uh, and, and and that it, it does it doesn't just. That's not just about the other, though. It's also about, to your point, it's about respect for ourselves as well. And I get this idea from Socrates, who in turn got this from. Uh, no, so, sorry. Um, uh, who in turn influenced Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, who makes a, a, an observation about this in his letter from Birmingham jail. But what Socrates says is that virtue is its own reward. Treating others with justice is its own reward because a just soul that acts with justice towards others is a well-ordered, it's a healthy soul. And that is its own reward. Whereas uh, acting with viciousness, with injustice towards others, that is its own punishment because that is a symptom of a disordered, of an unhealthy soul. And so when we see people in the world acting with viciousness and injustice towards others, we should not hold them in contempt. We should actually have compassion for them because they are suffering, they are sick, they are soulishly uh, they have a soulish malady, even if they don't realize it, that we should have compassion for the people who, are, who, are, who act with injustice. And, and Dr. K makes a similar argument in his letter from Birmingham Jail. He, he references um, many important thinkers from Aristotle to, to Socrates to, to you know, Martin Buber and Augustine. And um, King makes an important observation about segregation. He says, segregation does not just hurt the segregated. It obviously does. It, it dehumanizes them. And it dehumanizes them. It gives them a false sense of inferiority. But it also hurts the segregator. It, it deforms their soul, he says. It gives them a false sense of superiority. And there's a whole debate after the Civil War uh, about whether the South, uh, uh, a, plan, a kind of aristocracy of, of white plantation owners, who made their living and lived their lives abusing and, and sub subjugating an entire class of, and a subsection of, of human beings, whether that subsection of human beings, the plantation owning aristocracy, could be reintegrated into a democracy because there had their, the argument was that their souls from repeatedly abusing others by being another human being, by being complicit in slavery, the argument was that their souls had been so deformed they were not suited for self-governance and, and for, for, for freedom, for living in a free democratic society anymore. And so to your point that you respect others, not for others, but for you, that's that's part of it. And that's part of the argument I make in this book. That's part of the argument that, that Socrates, that, that, that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made, that, that yes, respecting others is good for its own sake. But we also insufficiently appreciate that when we hurt others, we hurt ourselves too. But the inverse is also true. When we are kind and generous and gracious and hospitable to others, we ennoble both parties as well. Of course, we, we affirm the humanity and dignity of others, but we, we also make ourselves a little bit more human and a little bit more humane as well. So it's a great observation. Thanks for that. 
All right. So Lexi, we are out of time, but what, and so if you're going to come over to the um, little reception, then we'll, we'll get your question. But I wanted to know if um, this is a curveball I'm throwing at you, but uh, something to take home. And we ended the car, the second Carmel event with some talk about the little things important yeah. to democracy and uh, so many people commented that they found that helpful to go home with something to do. Yes. Can, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Uh, talking to your neighbor, someone yes. you don't know. Could you just give us two minutes and then John's going to close us out? Yes, absolutely. I think we left the, um, the Carmel event just last week with the small mandate, the maxim, like know your neighbors, just that small thing of knocking on the door, welcoming a newcomer, just, you know, if there's that neighbor that you've you know, kind of nodded at, but don't actually know their name or their story, just know them. And that too has instrumental benefits, but is also inherently good. It's good to know your neighbors in case there's a crisis, right? Like you want people, the people that you're surrounded with to be watching out for you and you want to watch out for other people. That's, that's, a, that's a practical good. But it's also just objectively inherently good to just, just to, to know the people that you inhabit space with and, 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 and do life together with that. It's good. That's good for its own sake. Maybe a practical thing here is make a small bid of friendship to someone new. You know, there's someone in your life, whether it's a stranger, a, a, a newcomer at work, newcomer to your neighborhood, uh, a stranger at a coffee shop, you know, or you're at the playground and, and strike up a conversation with, with the, with the, with a new set of parents, a new set of friends for your kids. That, you know, Robert Putnam in his book Bowling Alone, he says there are two kinds of social capital. There's bridging capital and bonding capital. Bonding capital is like. Um, it, it, it's like super glue. People who are already like you, that are at your church, that are a part of your community, that are part of your Kiwanis club, people that you already have a share set of core values that are already like you, that is bonding capital. It's like super glue. It makes people who are already like even tighter together. But then there's something called bridging capital. And bridging capital is not just um, bonding people with people who are already like you. It's like reaching across the divides that, that the, we kind of, it's really easy to just kind of orbit in our regular spheres, from our homes to our schools to our workplaces to our regular grocery stores and back again. And, when, and we don't really actually have opportunity to encounter people outside of our little spheres. And this is where people like Jeff Worrell, like, like John Delucia, like my mother, like my grandmother come in. They're constantly meeting and collecting people and they're constantly bridging. Like they, that is what makes the world go round. And that, that bridging capital is actually essential to, to healing um, deep divisions in our world, not just like you know racial, economic, social divisions, because there, there are those, right? That it's easy to just kind of be around people who are like us and who agree with us and think like us. But, but also it's just a part of making people feel seen and known and loved. So my challenge to you is step outside of your little sphere, wherever you are, and make a tiny bid you know, of, of, of for friendship with someone new, someone you might either know but want to get to know better, or someone outside of your sphere entirely, you know, embody the value and, and harness the superpower of, of bridging capital uh, tomorrow, just in, in a small way or sometime this week. That's that's my challenge to you. Great. Let's give a round of applause. <clears throat> Homework. We've got some teachers in the room. Bridging capital. Um, but thank you so much. And thank you, Jeff. Let's give Jeff a round of applause. And John. Um, thank you, John. Well, but thank you all so much for coming. Um, Jeff and Lexi have done this before, and, and Jeff does a lot of facilitating for the One Zone, so he was kind enough to cross the river, um, and, and Carmel's done some good things. There's a lot of interest in Fishers, and, and thank you again to Knowledge Services yes, for hosting. Thank you. thank you so much, Tom Britt. Um, is live streaming it so that's available for those Thanks, who weren't here um so basically lexi is going to be signing books um right out in the lobby and thank you to the village dove and emily colmanar is out there and then you can head to um kind of the cafe area parks place pub has provided cookies don't get too excited no no cheese curds and uh, <laughs> no alcohol but and, and there's some refreshments, so please stay. There's information at the tables uh, from some of the not-for-profits that are here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is really the beginning. I do need to give some coverage to my uh, school corporation friends. There's a school board meeting tonight. 
Uh, and Tiffany had this slip out. There's a homeowners or so. There's just a lot of stuff, <laughs> right? a lot of big people. So please, if you didn't sign up through the event, right, please, you know, share your contact information because we want to collaborate with yeah. this group. There's a lot of good discussion going on. And just, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to come out and please check out the book, get some cookies and well, you can build a bridge tonight. If there's somebody you here you don't know, introduce yourself or I'd be happy to connect you. Um, and again, thank you again for coming and have a wonderful, wonderful night. Thank build you. some bridges.